and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple. The creator of the Weird West RPG known as Huckleberry. Make, you, make your tombstone jokes, I know you've got them. <laughs> the, one, the one and only Steven Alexander. How you doing today, man? Well, I'm your Huckleberry. I'm doing well. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, thank you for com thank you for coming on and for I would say braving the hell of time zones, but you're in the you're in continental North America, so it's not that bad. Uh, yep, yep, I am in continental North America, so yeah, uh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. huh. I mean, the, with those kind of with that kind of thing, the worst I have to deal with is some weird um, hour and change time zones in some parts of Canada. Uh, yeah, I'm California, so it's not too bad. Uh, yeah. And uh, I I grew up East Coast, so all my family's on there, so I, I'm used to making the time zone change. It's no big deal. Yeah, Cali, that's just a two that's just a two hour difference. Uh, though I w I will admit, whenever people in warmer climates have to deal with sudden amounts of snow or snow or cold, I'm always that one person laughing because I have because of all the smoke I have to hear about. Oh, uh, aha, it's nice and warm down here, and you're up there freezing. Uh, yeah, I, I grew up in uh, northern Indiana, which gets a ton of lake effect snow. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I used to have to deal with that every winter. And uh, I, I was recently in Indiana again for Gen Con, and uh, going back there, I'm like, man, I'm glad I don't have to deal with that anymore. Huh. I was in I was in Georgia during a during a bit of a snowfall and it was like it was like one inches in cha in change of snow and everybody's panicking like it's the end of the world and I'm like motherfucker it's one inch that that's how it is in California with the rainstorm uh, people never learned how to drive in the rain because it only happens uh, a couple months out of the year I know that there's been um, horror stories about L A drivers. Then when I ended up spending a week in L.A. because I was at E3 one year, I decided that everybody who had been telling me those stories was underselling it. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm actually a bit further north than that, but I've been to L.A. enough to, yeah, it, it's not fun. It's not yeah. fun at all. That's the reason Futurama kept making vicious jokes at it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, it, was like the, it was like the end of the world was around me. Dude, you're in L.A. Who were fighting each other for a box of scraps? Dude, you're in L.A. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Uh, so, one of the traditions around here is opening up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, all right. Uh, yeah, when my very first introduction to role-playing games... Uh, was in the fourth grade. Uh, I had switched schools, uh, so I was meeting a whole new group of people. And uh, someone I was on the bus with, you know, we're just little kids, we got tiny backpacks, and his backpack was stuffed full of the brand new game called D&D 3rd Edition. Uh, I'd never even heard of D&D before then. Uh, it wasn't something that was even on my radar. Uh, and I would sit on the bus after school. We had a half hour ride home and we would just flip, flip through those pages together. And I got to see all the badass art that was in there. Like I, I'd read some fantasy books here and there, but I was really more of a sci-fi kid. I loved Star Wars. Uh, so it was a, almost a whole new genre for me, uh, seeing all of that. Uh, and we bonded over that. And uh, honestly, the, the rest became history. What made it stick uh, just the idea of being able to create my own characters. Uh, it, we were fourth graders, so like our campaigns weren't that deep, uh, and we would only be able to get together whenever our parents allowed it, you know, when they were willing to drive us uh, around because we lived too far away. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the majority of my early RPG career was just me 
begging my mom to print off more character sheets because I wanted to fill in the boxes even more. Uh, so that was really my introduction to RPGs was my, I, I had folders and folders of just pages of character sheets. I can, I can certainly understand that. And I, I'm no stranger to doing that kind of thing, especially since I have used the whole 10 cents a page thing at the library where I grew up. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. Yeah. It's 10 cents a page, a dollar a page for color, but who's going to print you? Who's, but I don't even like printing color, even, even with my own damn printer. Then again, no. Oh, no, I, I wasn't playing printing color back then. It, it, I, I was lucky to get double-sided. Yeah. Then, then, again, who, then again, who the hell is going to print character sheets in color? Oh. Yeah, exactly. Of course, of course, I'm, per, I'm personally cursed when it comes to printers and fax, fax machines to the point that when I, fi when I finally replaced mine, I decided to get some friends together and reenact that one scene in Office Space. Yeah, yeah, where they all get around with hammer, uh, the baseball bats. Mm -hmm. Just be just beating the ever loving shit out of the fax machine. Cathartic. Uh, that that's why you like role playing games. You get got to work out emotions somehow, right? Mm -hmm. And I will. I I'm not gonna say how I'm not gonna say how bad the the printer was after after we finished um, having our fun. I will say that the that after that I decided not to use aluminum bats anymore because. I ended up beating that thing so hard I bent it. <laughs> oh no. In my defense, I was working I was working out seven years worth of frustration on that thing. Yeah, yeah, I get it. <laughs> like, you gotta pull the guy back like in office space. Mm -hmm. I was I was the one having to get pulled back because it's like this this thing has been this thing has been giving me nothing but hell for the last seven years. I am getting all of my shit in. But Give now, given that given that origin point, I'm guessing that you had jumped around between a bunch of different games over the years before deciding to make your own with Huckleberry. Uh, yeah. So actually, the the progression of games was pretty linear. You know, I I was raised with D and D three. Um, I didn't actually play three point five. Uh, I I stuck with three because I already had the books. Uh, and I didn't have the spending cash to, you know, buy those again. Um, when D and D four was coming out, I was starting my first job, uh, so I had the cash to buy those. So I bought the box set, uh, and I didn't play a ton of four, but I I was into it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I liked what they were going for. Uh, it I wasn't as chronically online then as I am now, so I didn't really know a lot of other people's opinions about it to kind of taint my opinion. My uh, take with, my take with. Yeah. Around here, we call fourth the edition we're supposed to hate, but we don't because we're not getting paid. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I thought there was a lot of fun stuff about it, but honestly, it it wasn't at the point in my life where I was able to get a campaign together. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next campaign I actually got together after fourth came out was a three E campaign, anyways. Uh, so I, I found some more D and D players, but they were still on three. Uh, so yeah, I, I jumped to four, but didn't get a lot of experience with it. Uh, and I played a bit of Pathfinder in between a little bit, not much. Uh, and then uh, 5e came out, and uh, I was I, I dove head deep into that. I really enjoyed 5e. Uh, when it first came out, it felt fresh. It felt familiar at the same time. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, and it wasn't until... Uh, couple of years ago that I got uh, connected with some, uh, made some new friends uh, online in streaming groups. And one of those groups was Adventures in Lollygagging, uh, who I still stream with and who is publishing Huckleberry. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are deep in the indie system, systems. Uh, and I, I learned so many new mechanics. I learned about so many new games. I, I'd always wanted to try more indie systems. But it's just hard to find people who are also into learning a new system every couple months. Uh, so once I got to play with the lollygaggers, I, I dug my fingernails in and I said, I'm not letting go. You're taking me with you wherever you go. Uh, and that was a, a couple few years ago now. And I've played, uh, geez, countless systems now. Uh, nice. it, it's crazy how fast everything bloomed from there. Mm -hmm. And... Some of some of that we'll get into, but I want to I want to I want to do a bit of a 
a bit a bit of word association slash lightning round with with you. Consider this a really really yeah. bad Rorschach test. Um, uh, so can do. Given the fact that this is a weird West game, I'm as the as the title indicates, I'm gonna list off a few. I'm gonna list off a few names, and you can tell me if this if this was a game that you had had um were familiar with if it was one that you had dipped into it at, at any points uh, that kind of thing yeah sounds good all right um boot hill uh i have read boot hill i know it mostly by its reputation all right i think fig- i figured that'd be the case that's one of the uh, that's one of the obvious ones to go with um aces and eights I, within reach of me right now, I have a signed leather-bound hard copy of Aces and Eights. I have not yet been able to play it, but I'm a huge fan of Kenzer Co., and I, I love the book. It's a beautiful book. Um, Dust Devils. Dust Devils I have on PDF. Uh, I, I liked what I've read, but again, not been able to get it to the table. All right. Uh, Desperados. The one, the one that was adapting the video game. Uh, I do not know about that one. You, you got me there. Gunslingers and Gamblers. That was that weird one that used uh, poker dice. Uh, I actually have a set of poker dice, so there's no reason for me not to know about this, but I, I haven't heard of this one either. Mm-hmm. Um, and the bi- the big one, the the one that I'm pretty sure a lot of people have brought up given the subject matter, Deadlands. I have read every edition of Deadlands. I will admit I've never played a single session. Uh, I've also never played Savage Worlds yet. There were a couple times where I was supposed to, and the the you know like gaming you know schedules are the big bad evil guy. Uh, it never came around to happening. Uh, so that, that's kind of like my uh, uh, white whale. White whale. Yeah. Uh, it, I. I, I would like to play a session because I'm making a weird West game. There's no reason for me not to have played Deadlands, uh, but uh, it's never happened yet. Oh, since you mentioned dipping into that, does that also include some of the side versions of Deadlands like Hell on Earth and Noir? Uh, so it does not include uh, Hell on Earth. I have uh, read Noir, not played it. Okay. And for context, Hell, Hell on Earth is basically them taking the Deadlands concept and throwing it, throwing it in with Mad Max. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've seen the cover. I actually have the PDF. I've just never actually opened it. Yeah, I have way too many gaming PDFs. It's a problem. Uh, if my wife saw the receipts, I'd be in trouble. It's only a problem if we stop. And I guarantee, no matter how many PDFs you have, um, there's more in my library. Oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe. I have not done a head count in a while, mostly because I'm afraid of of the terror that's going to be in front of me. Oh. Sometimes it's better not to know. Mm-hmm. It's like Call of Cthulhu. Sometimes you want to fail that intelligence check. Yeah. Now, I the Savage Worlds part is in, is interesting because I'm pretty sure some people have brought that up since the since um the core mechanics that you have mm-hmm. with with um Huckleberry. It seems very clearly lean around die sizes rather than more than more than they do straight numbers. Yeah, so uh, I've had uh, Huckleberry described as like a weird cousin of Savage Worlds. Um, with me not actually playing Savage Worlds, I don't know fully how close it is. Uh, again, I've read the rules, so I'm I'm familiar with it. But honestly, when I was making Huckleberry, Savage Worlds wasn't even on my radar yet. Uh, it. The the core conceit for Huckleberry is that I wanted to use every single die size. And not just that, I wanted to use them as much as I can. I've got a lot of dice, and I like to roll them. Dice goblin. Uh, so, yeah, it, essentially, uh, I, I made a game that requires two sets of dice. Uh, it, it doesn't really require it. You can get by with one set. Uh, but the, to make it easier, you have two sets of dice, and you're rolling different sizes paired with another die of different sizes. And I wanted a a mechanic that would slide up and down the scale. Uh, and that just happened to align with Savage Worlds. Um, given, although, given that, 
I think the, on the only thing in common I see with Savage Worlds is rolling different die sizes. There's two games that I'm more reminded of looking at how things are, me are meant to work. Uh, I I'm interested to hear what games you think, because there are two games in my head that were like the biggest inspirations for Huckleberry. I'm and I'm curious sure I'm if you caught on wrong on this. Uh -huh. <laughs> we'll find out. So given the given the um given the pairing setup, the one of the first things that instantly comes to mind is Ryutama and some and some of the games that have been inspired by Ryutama, whether it be Fabula Ultima, whether it be um whether it be pretty much everything that Rookie Jet Studio has been put has been putting out lately. Uh, well it's I have yeah. except for Espers. I don't know I haven't I'm not gonna be um taking a look at Espers until tomorrow. But that's what that's one of them because of that combination setup. The other one is Houses of the Blooded slash um Honor and Blood by John Wick. No not that one. Uh and the main reason I say that is the OG John Wick because of the rule of ten that you have that you have here. Oh. Yeah, so uh, I'll be honest with you, I've not actually read either of those games. So Ryutama, I've heard nothing but good things about, mm -hmm. and I've read about ten pages of it. I've read the entire travel section uh, because I, I read that was like really interesting mechanics, and they are. Uh, I, I really enjoyed those. The rest of the system, I've not even glanced at. Uh, so that that is interesting to hear. Um, Honor and Blood, I I don't even have that PDF. I've never cracked um, it open blood, uh, blood to actually know what the correct, mechanics are I like. Correct myself on that one. Um, okay. Both of it's using the same system as Houses of the Blooded, and even though it's doing, I believe D, I believe D sixes. It's been a while. Oh, uh, the. Core, the core part of it is the rule of ten. If you if you have a rule that beats ten, then you're able to narrate the you're able to have narrative control over the outcome. If not, then the GM has narrative control over the outcome. Yeah, uh, so that that's similar to the Huckleberry mechanic, uh, and it, it's very clearly the the same sort of like design philosophy that i was going for but i i haven't actually read that system yeah. so when i was making the huckleberry core mechanic um what i i really had two goals i wanted to use all the die sizes and i wanted it to move quickly mm -hmm. um so that is why it's player facing and it's just a 10 as a success so uh, you because player facing, I, does that mean the gm doesn't roll uh correct uh the gm does not actually roll dice in huckleberry uh i when I'm GMing, I roll dice for like targeting, like who is this monster going to attack, things like that. Uh, but Huckleberry is asymmetrical. Uh, so the players have their own mechanics and the GM has uh, their own mechanics. Uh, so the Huckleberry does have a random mechanic where they will draw cards and the suit determines different things. Uh, but the GM does not actually need to roll dice. Mm -hmm. I so when, when it comes to the core mechanic then... Uh, the reason for the 10 is a success is because it's a nice round number, uh, and I wanted players to be able to roll their dice and immediately know whether they succeed or fail. Uh, I, I didn't want to have to do any back and forth with uh, the GM having to set a difficulty or say, like, does a 17 hit? No. And then they keep guessing, does a 19 hit? No. You know, I, I wanted it to be clear and move things faster there. Uh, uh, obviously, no shade to other systems because I love them all. Uh, but that was my goal, was just to be able to keep combat moving fast. I wanted it to feel punchy, I wanted it to be cinematic, and I felt the best way to do that would be for players to be able to say, okay, I hit, let's keep going. Mm -hmm. But e even with that, you have a bit of a degree of success ca kind of approach with aces, and the fact that every every two points above ten you get, you generate an ace. Yeah, yeah, uh, so... The way I describe aces is that they are uh, a fuel for greater success. Mm -hmm. uh, so for every two points over, like you said, 12, 14, 16, 18, you're dealt an ace. Um, you can be dealt up to four aces on a single roll. Uh, you can use them to basically do critical damage, to give your allies a boost, uh, for any sort of cool narrative effect to happen. Or, if you don't have anything on that specific role you want to use them for, you tuck them up your sleeve like a, a cheating gambler. 
um, and you can save them for a failed roll in the future, uh, where you can use those aces. You discard one ace to give yourself plus two to a roll. So say you roll a seven between your two dice, you discard two aces, that turns it into an 11, and you succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, as the great bard Kenny Rogers once said, you got to know when to hold them, and you got to know when to fold them. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the aces are really a way to give more agency to players, uh, to really give them the control over their fate and their destiny. Fate is a big theme in Huckleberry as well. Mm -hmm. um, and allow them to determine when they're going to take the fail, essentially. And also a little bit of gambling, because I, I, I like push your luck mechanics. Yeah. And speaking of push your luck, on the trail boss end of things, you have the you have the whole anti up concept. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I I'm especially proud of the anti up concept. Uh, so one of the two games that was like really inspiring to me when I was making Huckleberry is the Year Zero system, mm -hmm. uh, specifically Forbidden Lands. And in Forbidden Lands, the monsters you roll a d6 to determine what action or attack they're going to make. And that's a very similar mechanic to anteing up. So when a trail boss is deciding, uh, when a trail boss takes a turn, uh, they will do a, a simple action for their uh, hostile, which is moving or uh, aiming, something along those lines, and then they ante up. The ante will be one of the four card suits, uh, you know, like clubs, spades, uh, diamonds, or hearts, and that'll determine what attribute is targeted on the player and it'll also determine what the attack looks like which player is targeted what's the range of the attack what are the effects of the attack uh so every hostile has a anti-up like stat block mm -hmm. uh and it, it's not quite like solo play it, it's not that there is an artificial intelligence to this it requires the gms to make choices and determine how to best attack things uh, but it does take a little bit off the GM load when it comes to that sort of strategy, and it keeps things feeling cinematic at the same time. Mm -hmm. I can, I can certainly get, I can certainly get that, and I will never say no to card mechanics within oh, TTRPGs because I, even to this day, I still feel that that's something that is woefully underrated in terms of how it's been explored. Even to I think the the biggest problem with user. card mechanics, I, I think the biggest problem with card mechanics in RPGs is that they tend to be a little too granular, where like you have to look up specific things and you have to like you know with aces and eights. I I love aces and eights. Don't get me wrong. If you want to play a crunchy weird, uh, crunchy Western game, that's the game to go to. But the way it uses card mechanics, you have to like look up on the graph. You know, you have to pull out the overhead uh, projection uh, to determine things. And uh, I, I think that's partly why it hasn't quite caught on because there, it, it's associated with crunchy games. Uh, so one of the great things about Huckleberry, uh, again, is I want things to move fast. Yeah. So with there are really three conditions for anteing up. One is the suit. Uh, one is whether it's a face card or not. And another is whether it's an ace or not. Mm -hmm. uh, if an ace comes up, that's good for players. If a face card comes up, that's bad for players. And then the suit determines the action. And for me personally, I've, I've never understood the whole card, bit, card base affair being tied to crunchier games because my introduction to the concept was the two games using the Saga engine back in the 90s. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Dragonlance Fifth Age and the Marvel Adventure game. Neither, I haven't played either of those. So maybe that's just my own connection. Yeah, neither happening. of them are very, are very, cr are very crunchy at all. Dragonlance Fifth Age is slightly crunchier, if only because it you, it has eight suits instead of four. Uh, basically, taking the primary four and split it and splitting it into two different suits. Uh, but your in that thing, your health axes, both your your health and your level are both tied to your hand. You're playing cards from that hand. Uh, if you're playing a card of the same suit as the action you're attempting, that card's a trump card, and you can play another one. Um, it's, I think it, I think it, I think it's more of there's just the brain rot of, um, of you need it, you need dice for an RPG kind of thinking, even though in reality you don't. I mean, we have, we've had diceless games for about 30 years now, bordering on 40. Yeah, I could see that. Um, I, 
I definitely think there's a case to be made for trying new mechanics and new ideas with RPGs, breaking out of the traditional, you know, mechanics that we have. But there's also a case to be made for keeping those. Uh, and I, I might get a little philosophical here because my brain wanders when I'm in designer mode. But accessibility for players is huge. And that's why D&D is, you know, reign supreme. Because once people learn the system, it's easier for them to learn variations of that system uh, or to continue with that system. So people know how to roll a D20 and know essentially, like, okay, higher number is better, lower number bad. Uh, and that just makes it a lot easier to role play, which in the end is good for everyone. The more people playing is always better, e even if they're not trying new mechanics, in my in my opinion. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to character creation, um, obviously you have these you have these steps that were mentioned, but one of the one of the ones I wanted to uh, I wanted to I wanted to lean into is what separates the weird die from the other attribute die. So I mentioned earlier how fate is a big mechanic mm -hmm. in Huckleberry. Um, the weird, W-Y-R-D, um, which is like a Norse word for fate, um, and it also is an easy pun with weird as in strange. Mm -hmm. um, the weird is this magical corruption uh, across the world. Huckleberry's not actually set on Earth. It's set on the next Earth. People have migrated off of Earth. It has been destroyed. And they are in the weird frontier now. Um, so the weird is this magical corruption that uh, affects everything. It cannot be stopped. It uh, cannot be cured. The best you can do is hope to slow it down. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it essentially that corruption is your fate. It, you will succumb to it at some point. It is your destiny. And how can you control your destiny? So that's where the attribute comes in. It goes up and down. Um, most of your other attributes stay the same unless you like level them up through character progression. Uh, the weird die goes up and down as the session progresses to show how much luck you've burned through, how much the fates are favoring you, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what separates it from the other attributes. Is it... Uh, you know, there are four attributes, uh, standard attributes. It's your uh, quick, your grit, your reckon, your spirit. Uh, and then the weird attribute is the one that just is how much luck you have left to your name at this point. Yeah, I could, I could, I could certainly see that. And with that, with that in, with that in mind, given the fact that one of the other aspects of the design is the traits and and how traits can be can be something of a of a descriptor you know blood flesh calling um dispositions and legend well i'm mostly mostly focusing on the first three when it comes to this what if somebody wanted to add a new trait in in terms of their in terms of their particular campaign or their particular table what would be the dividing line between what would what you would consider a blood trait, a flesh trait, and a calling trait? Uh, so the the traits, the way I have them, uh, the way I have them balanced is mostly uh, the the blood traits are physical traits, but they tend to represent things that you could inherit from your parents. Uh, so, like devil child is one of those traits, mm -hmm. and I. I try to give the traits evocative names that could give you like a jumping off point for describing your character, but that could also go multiple ways. Uh, so like the ironclad is a blood trait uh, in that it is intended to be like a cyborg type character, you know, like a, a wild west steampunk esque cyborg. Uh, but also if you want to just say that you have a, a fist made of iron, you know, or something like that, uh, that that could play into that. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the devil child, you may just have anger issues. You may not actually have a demon for a parent. Yeah. Uh, so it, it really comes down to the theme uh, of the ability that I have. And that's kind of what decides. Uh, the flesh traits are physical characteristics that are unique to you, not necessarily inherited. Uh, like Iron Fist uh, mm -hmm. goes along with the Iron Clad. That could mean that you just are a 
brute of a person, uh, and when you punch, you hit hard, or it could you mean you have a literal iron fist, like it's made out of the metal alloy. Um, so I, I don't know if I've actually answered your question here, but essentially the way I divide them is, is by narrative theme, uh, and then I balance the abilities accordingly. Mm -hmm. And there, there is also the there is also the fact that on the on the character sheet you have you have some check marks for dispositions and legend. Yes, that's because uh, you can gain more traits as you progress. Mm -hmm. uh, so you start with one disposition, which is your personality. Uh, it that is uh, personalities are complicated. So as you progress in the game, you can gain an additional disposition. Uh, and the way you keep track of that is uh, as you train it, you just check off a box. As you train it again, you check off the next one, and then you get your disposition. Uh, also, people change. Uh, so dispositions can change as well, which is why there's the third checkbox as well. Uh, so if you train your dispositions after getting the second one, you can just swap them out. Uh, it really adds a lot of... Uh, replayability to a character it allows you to change a character over time uh, it, mechanically a GM could say okay this disposition has changed that's not quite rules as written but honestly we're GM so rules as written only matter when they work uh, so it, you know if, if someone has a meaningful event change their character it makes sense for their disposition to change with mm -hmm. uh, printing the legend you don't start with that uh, so the legend traits, uh, you have to really build a reputation. Uh, and the legend traits tend to be the most powerful traits. They tend to be action-based, normally combat-based. Um, so you have to essentially build up a reputation as a gunslinger or, you know, great with a shotgun, something along those lines. Uh, and as you train your legend trait, uh, you, you unlock a new ability. Mm -hmm. um. <clears throat> Now, when it comes to the weapon end of things, the big irons, it's look. What I do find interesting is that you almost have a bit of a tag system regarding how the how the weapons work. Yeah, a a absolutely. Uh, so traits are part of character progression, but the character progression that I wanted to really lean into was more. Uh, I wanted to do wide progression rather than tall. Uh, I, I wanted people to be able to expand on existing abilities and then not necessarily become godlike. Uh, so big irons are a big part of that. Uh, in Huckleberry, every uh, big iron is a weapon, but not every weapon is a big iron. Big irons are customized. They're specific to your maverick. Uh, they're essentially an extension of you. Uh, they represent your combat style as much as anything else. Uh, and you have to heavily modify them uh, to make them work for you. So if you're in a firefight and you uh, shoot down an outlaw who had a pistol, you can pick up that pistol to keep firing, but that pistol's not as good as the one that you've been, spent time uh, modifying, cleaning, perfecting. Uh, it's just not going to be as good. So that's what the big iron is. The big iron is the one that is specific to you. Uh, they have tags specifically to represent different traits modifying big irons is an important part of the game uh mm -hmm. you spend some of your pastime tinkering uh gunsmithing is what it's called uh and you can like for a revolver you can give it extended ammo it, it, like you're making the cylinder bigger uh if you have a tomahawk you can silver it so it'll work against some monsters better uh things along those lines uh, and that's kind of where tags come in as well it allows the mods to uh, be a little bit more accessible like you don't have to read through the list of mods you just have your tags and you're like okay this is a thrown item i know that i can throw it without having any uh at, at least as far as medium range or so on yeah i can i can certainly get that now with that in with that in my with that in mind i suppose that i suppose through that somebody could have the have the big iron that's just way too big, like one of those. Um, they call they call the Magnum Research BFR, which they claim stands for Big Frame Revolver, but we know what it really right, should right, stand right. for. 
which would then gain the bulky tag if we're tying it into the discussion. Yeah. Uh, or some, or just some of the... I've always had a soft spot for ridiculously overpowered but very unsafe weaponry and giving that to my players. Uh, the yeah. what, I, what I mean by that whole powerful but unsafe, if, if I had to use one example, that's the Ur example of that thinking. It's the noisy cricket. Yep, yep, yep. Men in black. You know, fire does a lot of damage, but every time you fire the thing, you get knocked on your ass and get thrown 30 feet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I really love those types of weapons, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and something else in Huckleberry that I really strive for is to have the scenarios, the bounties that you chase down, have meaningful consequences, uh, both narratively and mechanically. Uh, so the the core book right now, uh, it, it's in early access, uh, and it will be expanded upon over the next several months. It's going to be getting regular updates. It's currently fully playable. Uh, it, it, it's ready to go, uh, but we want to add more like GM mechanics, things like that. Uh, also, scenarios are where a lot of that type of stuff will come in. Uh, scenarios will have uh, special weapons or special weapon mods uh, that are unique and can only be gained by playing that specific scenario. Uh, for instance, in one of the scenarios that's written and in editing right now, there is a master gunsmith. Um, and if he survives the scenario, you can recruit him to your town, and he will give you a special modified uh, revolver, or he will offer to give you a special mod that cannot be found in the core book. Mm -hmm. um, things like that, where those are much more powerful and may come with some drawbacks as well, like you said. Uh, I suppose I suppose if I had to use a video game example of this whole powerful but dangerous, it would probably be the first Alice game. Because pretty much all the weapons in there are very powerful, but they're kind of hard to use. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, there won't be as many weapons with the drawback. They would have to be really powerful for that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I appreciate that idea as well, but with Huckleberry being meant to empower players, meant to play fast, I, I try to avoid as many punishing mechanics as I can. Um, it, it's meant to uh, make players be heroic. Not necessarily be heroes. They're not necessarily good people, but they are the action stars of the movie. You know, like, you're not going to see Arnold Schwarzenegger very often, you know, flying back because of the noisy cricket. No, he's a buff dude, uh, and he, he's going to be pulling out that reviver, and he's going to, you know, be firing over and over and over. And if he hands it to his buddy, you know, just random Joe Schmo in a uniform who doesn't have a name, that guy will be the one flying back. Uh, and that's who Mavericks are. Mavericks are the heroes. Uh, they're, they really are the most competent people around, mm -hmm. and they can tap into their fate. They can control their fates ever so slightly uh, to be able to avoid those types of things. Yeah, now, given the, given the fact that a large amount of the gameplay loop is dealt with the bounties, do you, within future updates do you plan on ha having some sort of scenario or mi or mission or even bounty generator that a gm could randomly roll to deter to quickly set up future bounties yes that is uh actually exactly where my main focus is right now that'll be one of the earliest updates mm -hmm. um so bounty generation will be very important i, I want to be able to m give easy tools for gms to be able to uh create those bounties uh, I, I listened to an interview with uh, uh, Schwab, the guy who uh, designed uh, Shadows of the Demon Lord and mm -hmm. the uh, Weird Wizard. Uh, and he was talking about, I create games that are meant to be played. And that really resonated with me because I had already started this strategy. Like, I want to be able to release a ton of scenarios so that GMs have the ability to pick and choose. Huckleberry is out. Uh, it is complete and ready to be played. That doesn't mean I'm done with it. I I'm not going to just pack up and move on. I want people to be able to have easy access to resources that make it easy for them to bring it to the table. So one of the big things that we'll have after we're um, getting out of early access, uh, work is already being done on it now, and it'll be released towards the end of early access, is we're going to release a whole season of bounties. Uh, so Huckleberry has the timekeeping uh, 
mechanics like you talked about where seasons happen uh consequences happen bounties determine whether your uh town grows or whether it slowly withers and dies uh gms will be able to pick up just an entire pack of uh bounties uh that they can plug and play with their own campaign or uh just play that as a campaign uh, the other thing in the future that will happen is that there will be a long-form campaign that can be interwoven with those seasonal bounties. That one's not quite uh, in progress yet. That'll happen after the season is ready to go. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get to that. And speaking of speaking of that, since you're de- since you're dealing with a variety of potential bounties, whether it be taking someone dead or alive, whether it be trying to capture or take out a particular uh, creature within within an area and pro- and probably bring back its head because you know you got to have you got to have something to show that you actually did it and you're not just blowing smoke uh right that brings that brings in a couple questions one is do you plan on having some sort of means to customize say hostiles beyond beyond just the uh, stock version uh yeah so uh creating hostels is uh another part of the gm section that will be added uh hopefully rather soon um it i want to empower gms uh i want you to be able to create your bounty and create the the people and the hostels that are in it um npcs are called folk in huckleberry uh there will be uh, mechanics to create them as well uh the other thing is that scenarios will also have their own unique hostels um, so that'll be a, a way that you can grab hostels. Say you don't necessarily like a story, but you like that creature. You can just pluck that stat block out there and use it wherever you want. Um, I, I want to have a just an, an, a huge breadth of content uh, for GMs to be able to pick and choose from. I, I think one of the big reasons that 5e is so enduring is because there's so much out there. When I run 5e, I don't homebrew anything because I don't need to. Uh, it, it's it's an easy game to GM. Obviously, Huckleberry will never reach that amount of content, but I want people to feel the same way. I want people to be able to uh, not be terrified of running Huckleberry because they know that they have to create a thousand stat blocks. I want them to be able to uh, just say, okay, I know that I can get you know 15 different options here uh, to be able to you know fill out my entire campaign. Uh, so that is very much a goal, uh, is to be able to make it easy to create hostels and to have a lot of them ready to go to choose from. Uh, there are 10 hostels in the core book right now. Those are essentially just examples uh, so that people can look and kind of understand the process, uh, can start playing. I, I would like to, it, in a perfect world, there will be 100 in the core book. Uh, whether it actually makes that way by the end of early access, I don't know. But I, I will aim to pack as many of them in there as I can because I, I want people to have the options. Mm-hmm. Something else that it that that um, I just that I gradually realized is a possibility worth exploring uh, as the, as things go in. It is the idea of trophy rewards because we a common thing that we see yeah. in plenty of mythologies is. The hero going out to slay a certain a certain beast and then using some part of it as a tool for fu- for future adventures. You know, you have Hercu- you have Her- Hercules or Heracles, depending on who you ask, dipping arrows in the bl- in the blood of the Hydra after he killed it. You have Perseus using Medusa's head to <laughs> uh, again yeah, against yeah, yeah. the against the Kraken in Revenge of- in Ra- in um, Clash of the Titans. You, ha- I remember when I played um, Scion first edition. I haven't touched second edition. Every one of the monsters in there had a trophy entry about how some part of that monster could be used, either in some form of equipment or or something like that. Uh, is that so- is that something that could that could potentially be done within Huckleberry? I absolutely love those mechanics like the the monster hunting mechanics boss hunting mechanics like uh monster hunter video games kingdom death monster where you hunt down specific bosses Mm -hmm. i i really love those Mm -hmm. mechanics where what you chase down will uh give you benefits in the future uh i had uh, a lot of mechanics there i i still 
I shouldn't say had. I have a lot of mechanics uh, that are along those lines. They're not ready to be released yet, but that is absolutely something that is a priority for me. Um, I had uh, an entire crafting chapter finished for Huckleberry, but as I uh, was looking at the complete product, the crafting just didn't fight quite fit in the way I wanted it to. Uh, it was a little bit too crunchy, a little bit too spreadsheety compared to everything else in the game. Um, so that is something that I plan on reworking, and I would like to have, like, okay, you killed this monster, you get, you know, these specific eyes from this monster have a various quality. Um, that is a huge priority for me, and in the meantime, until we get there, that's where scenarios come in. Uh, the, the bounties that you'll be able to get, they'll all have some sort of unique reward. It may not necessarily come from a monster, it might come from a person, but there will be in each scenario, there will be some sort of unique reward that is specific to that scenario in that bounty. Um, and you have to play that bounty if you want to get it. Of course, GMs can uh, easily grab that uh, reward and put it in a different bounty to suit their campaign. But I, I want to create an idea of like, if a, two different groups were talking to each other and they talk about the different bounties that they've chased and they say, hey, did you kill that werewolf? Or did you kill that? a giant scarecrow and if so like who got the who got the reward how did you split the rewards that kind of stuff i, I want them to be able to have a com camaraderie uh for both finishing the same storyline yeah i can i can certainly get that so with that with that in mind uh i know it's heading in, heading into early access soon, soon. Uh, it's in early access right now. It actually yeah. released uh, six days ago, uh, yeah. so it, it's very early, early access. Yeah, my bad. My bad. I jump. No worries. I don't no know worries. if you've noticed, but I spend a lot of plates. <laughs> no, I get it. Uh, I, yeah, I, I am exhausted right now because I just came back from Gen Con, uh, and that is when it launched. It, it launched at Gen Con. Uh, I ran several sessions of it. Um, I had very... Uh, limited uh physical copies uh to be given out uh I, it it honestly was the best launch i could ask for i had a ton of fun uh people uh it, it seemed to be very well received uh people were very enthusiastic i didn't have a single bad session mm -hmm. uh which if you've been to cons you know that those are quite uh common you know it, it's, people are tired you know they they've had long days they get to your session and they just are dragging uh I haven't had People as were many just... as I haven't had as many of those as others, but I think I think part of the reason is maybe no, maybe nobody wants to try and get snippy with the GM when the GM's a foot taller than everybody else. <laughs> that could be. That could be. I I don't have the benefit of being a foot taller than everyone else. No. Uh, but I'm six, uh, six, I so <laughs> yeah yeah uh, I it, it was just it was a great energy though uh, I had. Uh, I, I didn't have that many no-shows. Like, you know, with cons, uh, oftentimes you just have one person at the table. I had a full table every time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a blast. The creativity that was shown, the enthusiasm was, that was shown, uh, I could not have asked for a better launch. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I know this isn't really related to, like, the mechanics of the game, but uh, I, I'm coming off the high, so I'm going to talk about it a lot. <laughs> well, this the temple is more than just focusing on the mechanics exclusively, but also the story of the, the the as much the story of the creators and the creative process as as anything else um oh, good good something. so i can keep rambling yeah <laughs> but i i will note i will end i will end up going back to gen con one of these years and i guarantee you'll know you'll know because uh first off everybody's gonna be running away screaming about, about who let the giant in the room <laughs> <laughs> and se second off and second off um I am pro I'm probably going to cause some form of trouble. Not anything that'd get me that'd get me in legal trouble or anything like that, but just a little cause a little bit of chaos. You, you know, sent have some hand out some hand out the player's handbook to somebody and they open it up and it's completely mirror written or something. Which yes, I did that. Oh, okay. I did I did that when some when somebody asked me for my copy of the um three point five player's handbook. I gave him a replication I made that would that had all the text mirror written. All right, uh, a harmless troll. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, there's been there's been that. Uh, I think I I had a I think I had some dice that were that um I specifically commissioned to have the numbers in braille. 
and have somebody use those and he doesn't he doesn't know how braille works at all uh just because he want he wanted to borrow my dice he didn't tell me which ones to that he was willing to um borrow uh or the or there's been there's been just a, just a little bit of trolling even if, even if one incident is setting up a remote control air horn and hiding it in the bathroom <laughs> oh no yeah, I hid, I hid one. I hid one behind the toilet and just waited for somebody to go in and take care of their business. Then I hit a button and they run out screaming. Yeah, I would too. Uh, was, I've gotten the nickname the Prankster Prince, and even and um, hotels are are prime material for get for getting at some somebody. Uh, I think in. I did. I, uh, I've had some. I've had some cases where just the just the little things. I think. I think I put a bunch of D fours under some under somebody's sheets. So when they lay 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 down, they're laying on D on a, like a pound of D fours. Okay, that's not a little thing. That's just that's straight up evil, right there. <laughs> you know. Uh, I take that as a compliment. Like my job. When I'm GMing, my job is to make sure every everyone has fun. Oh, um, my job is not to be the nice guy. That's just wait, wait. So you're GMing someone when they lay down on a bunch of D fours? No, no. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that's my general philosophy. Ah, uh, I got gotcha, you. Gotcha, fun will be gotcha. fun will be had, but oh, um, I've because I'm I've developed a talent when it comes to playing the villain, and when I did theater, um. Nine times out of ten, I was typecast as the villain character. I think okay. it had to do with me being taller than everybody else. Uh, of course, of course, when it came to playing a corpse, everybody's trying to make you crack, and I remembered every single person who tried, and I'm like, "Don't worry, your receipt's coming. <laughs> it may not be today, it may not be next month, but you will get yours for trying to make me crack." But you know, just that. Just trying to bring that sort of chaotic energy to, to proceedings. Because everybody's going to do serious games. I don't want to do serious. I want to do games where dumb shit happens. Because everybody's going to remember the I, dumb shit. I, I get what you're saying there. Uh, one of the things about Huckleberry... Uh, sorry, sidestepping, but also along the same lines, mm -hmm. um, is that Huckleberry is about negotiation. Uh, so the attributes can pair with any of the skills. Uh, and the attribute rep represents like the intent uh, of how you're going about the skill. Mm -hmm. um, and I, at the beginning of every session, I say, hey, if you think that this should be a different attribute than the one I'm calling for, uh, call it out. I love that negotiation and I love the extra creativity that comes into uh, players' heads as they're like, what weird thing could I do to make this a grit check instead of a reckon check? Because uh, when they have like a goal like that, there's a switch that flips, and people just they they become incredibly creative. They start thinking of the crazy stuff that they're going to do to make it a specific attribute that's mechanically better for them, but narratively it's better for everyone else uh, to be able to see that kind of shit happen. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Now with with that said, do you do you plan? With the early access, do you plan on set? Do you, I know you already have a mailing list? Do you plan on using that to inform people of updates? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyone who uh, has uh, the PDF, uh, as soon as it updates, Drive Through RPG will send out uh, the update to you. Uh, well, or it'll send you an email saying, "Hey, your library has been updated." Um, and then when it comes to like the big updates, uh, the mailing list is the best way to learn about those, or on the Discord. Uh, so Adventures of Lollygagging is the streaming channel that is publishing Huckleberry. Uh, we have a Discord with a Huckleberry chat, uh, and that's where all the updates will be posted as well. I will say that if you uh, subscribe to the mailing list, you get some uh, cool digital goodies. Uh, so we talked a bit about how Huckleberry has a bounty board, mm -hmm. uh, where essentially players determine which bounties they want to chase uh, throughout a season. Uh, I have had created... a series of digital assets uh, that is the 
specifically for virtual tabletops, but can be printed out as well. Uh, it's a wooden bounty board, and then uh, you can create your own bounty posters. Uh, so it's got like pages, it's got uh, visual assets like stars and lines and squares and everything like that. Uh, so you can actually, if you create your own bounty, you can make the poster uh, for your players to visually see as a handout. Uh, with my home game, uh, I've got seven bounties on the board right now. Uh, so when it comes time for the next stretch for my players to decide what to do, uh, they get to look at those seven options and say, okay, this is the, the bounty that we want to chase, or this is the monster we want to go kill right now. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can certainly get that. And I will be looking forward to seeing how Huckleberry develops. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And of course, I'm always happy to talk shop. Yeah, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!